Greetings and salutations, everyone. As we read about the governors in Texas, it is hard not to observe the common traits between those who have previously served. We can also observe governors in Texas wield power. So, in this video, we will look at qualifications, powers, and controversy of a recent Texas governor. Let's begin. According to the Texas Constitution, there are three requirements to be governor. At least 30 years of age, a resident of Texas for at least five years, and a U.S. citizen. If we look back at previous governors, we can identify some common traits or informal qualifications that voters have had. For example, white ethnicity, male, conservative ideology, educated, and experienced. You may even have your own informal qualifications, like military experience, religion, or a certain age. Now, let's take a look at their power. While the governor is granted legislative, executive, and judicial powers by the Texas Constitution, the governor's powers can ultimately be divided into two categories, formal and informal. Formal powers are powers granted by the Texas Constitution and statutes, which are signing or vetoing bills passed by the Texas legislature, that is, approving or disapproving of bills submitted, serving as the commander-in-chief of the state's military forces, which is composed of the Texas Army National Guard, the Texas Air National Guard, and the Texas State Guard. Calling special sessions of the Texas legislature for specific purposes? Well, the last special session was called in July of 2017 that lasted for 29 days and assigned 21 topics. Estimating amounts of money required to be raised by taxation, accounting for all public monies received and paid out by them, and recommending a budget for the next two years. Granting reprieves and commutations of punishment and pardons, of course, upon the recommendation of the Board of Pardons and Paroles, and revoking conditional paroles. Declaring special elections to fill vacancies in certain elected offices. Appointing officials to be elected or appointed positions, such as members of the state boards, commissions, and councils. At this point, we may think the governor has significant amount of power, and they do. But we will compare Texas with another executive branch. But for now, note that the governor wields power to address the concerns of all Texans. Informal powers, on the other hand, are powers that are not explicitly listed or granted in the Texas Constitution or by statute. Since the governor is the highest elected official in Texas, the governor serves as the figurehead. In other words, they serve as the leader Texans rally and look to for answers and guidance in times of crisis, be it natural disasters or pandemics. The governor also leads the political party in the legislature calling on the party members in the legislature to push the governor's agenda and rally critical legislative votes. In the State of State Address, the governor has the power to set the agenda for the Texas legislature to address. 
as a statewide office holder, the governor can articulate the needs and concerns of all Texans. So, formal and informal powers give the governor the means to govern, but not all governors are the same. The manner for which they wield power might just create controversy. On Friday, April 12, 2013, Travis County District Attorney Rosemary Limburg was arrested for driving while intoxicated. According to media reports, Limburg possessed an open bottle of vodka in the car and her blood alcohol level was 0.239, which is nearly three times the legal limit here in Texas. Despite Limburg's disrespectful and hostile behavior toward police during the arrest, she pled guilty, paid a $4,000 fine, and served 45 days in jail. Shortly thereafter, in the summer of 2013, then-Governor Rick Perry threatened to veto funding allotted to the state's Public Integrity Unit, which was overseen by Limburg if she did not resign from her position. Limburg agreed to retire at the end of her term in office, but Governor Perry asserted that the DA violated the public's trust and should resign immediately. As such, the governor vetoed the funding to the Public Integrity Unit. There are three points we need to consider here. First, the Texas Constitution provides the governor the authority to veto and line-item veto for spending bills. Second, Governor Perry was a Republican. And finally, D.A. Limburg was a Democrat. A special prosecutor was appointed to investigate if, in fact, Governor Rick Perry abused his authority by vetoing the funding. And on August 15, 2014, Governor Rick Perry was indicted by a Travis County grand jury for abuse of power while in office. Perry surrendered to authorities four days later. In the end, all criminal charges were dismissed against Governor Perry by a grand jury. Critics of of Perry would assert that the governor abused his power for political consideration. Supporters of the governor would argue that Perry operated within the framework of the Texas Constitution. Regardless of where we might stand on the former governor's actions, the controversy launched Rick Perry into the national spotlight leading into the 2016 presidential election. As we have seen, the Texas governor is the highest elected official of the state, and they possess both formal and informal powers that empower them to govern. These powers also help them to establish their agenda in the legislature, lead their political party, and respond to the needs and concerns of all Texans. As the governor leads in the Texas legislature, we must be aware what their agenda is and how it benefits Texas. After all, the government is for the people, of the people, and by the people. This concludes the companion video.